What's going on, church family? Pastor McKinney here. Welcome to week eight, or shall I say episode eight of Reading the Bible Together. Just so you guys are aware, there's only two weeks left this week and next week, and then we will wrap up the summer season with a worship and prayer uh, online as well. And I'm trying to talk to Pastor Mike Reed, see if he can uh, do the final episode of Reading the Bible Together. So just pray that the Holy Spirit convicts him to do that, uh, so look forward to doing that with you guys there. Hopefully, again, you guys are um, doing well in your personal Bible reading plans. Uh, you should be coming to the end of the Gospel of Mark, and I have really come to enjoy and appreciate the Gospel of Mark. It's been a rich study for me personally, so uh, I hope it's been a blessing for you as it has been for, for me. Uh, just as a reminder, if you do want to post anything about what you're reading and your studying plan, it doesn't even have to be um, <clears throat> something from the Gospel of Mark that you're reading. It could be any sort of thing that you're, you're personally studying on your own. If you want to post on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, just make sure you put hashtag cab reads together uh, so that we can all see and engage with one another what we are, are doing. So let me, let's uh, uh, move on here. Uh, also, it's just a reminder... If you do want to uh, post anything, make sure you tag uh, our Instagram um, device or Instagram page at Church at Bergen. Uh, and I also have an account. If you want to follow me, you can. I post some things from time to time, whether it's from my sermons or just stuff from my family or even just personal devotions that I'm reading in my own Bible reading plan uh, time. But uh, most importantly, as I always say, um, follow uh, the church because that's where you're going to hear lots of information, updates, uh, especially with COVID-19 continuing to persist. But that is okay because uh, hopefully, Lord willing, again, we, we record these a week in advance. <laughs> um, and so we haven't really, we technically, we have not gathered on August 9th yet. But Lord willing, we will have um, gathered on August 9th by the time you guys are watching this video now. It kind of sounds strange saying that. Uh, but we're just going to be praying that the Lord continues to make that possible for us to gather here physically. I have, I have grown in my appreciation and my realization of the necessity of the physical gathering of the people of God inside of a church building or any sort of place where the physical people are gathering together. It is necessary for our spiritual well-being. Uh, so hopefully you guys are going to be blessed by that as well. Uh, well, as, as usual, we want to try to have at least um, a, a few times where you're able to hear from people in the church uh, church members uh, or wives of elders or uh, people who are other than pastors, other than the elders, other just regular church members uh, to hear what they could encourage you with in their own personal reading plan. So let's see who our next guest for today is. <clears throat> Who's it going to be? I think you can see the name on there anyways. There he is. What's up, Chris? Hey. How are you, man? Good, good. How are you? Good. You're, on, you're officially on TV right now. How's that feel? Uh, a little nerve-wracking, <laughs> but very cool. <laughs> okay, so if you guys don't know Chris Fandora, he is my brother-in-law, so he and I are the luckiest men alive because we married uh, Karen and Cassia just well, they're sisters, they look a lot alike, they're both members here. Uh, so Chris is my brother-in-law, uh, so I love him like a brother. He's also a church member, he's also on the board, helps with finances and stuff like that. Um, a lot of you guys may know who he is, and uh, I'm just so excited you're going to be on here. Uh, I have really come to see um, just the, what the, the Lord has done in Chris's life, uh, really grown in him a desire for the Word, uh, and to mature as a man of God, and to really be a, a, a leader in the church, Lord willing, someday. Uh, so that's why I reached out to him, not just because he's my brother-in-law, but also because I know that he loves Scripture. I know that he actually does read his Bible, uh, and he will have some encouraging things to say. So good to see you, Chris. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. And I was just, ma I was just making fun of him, not really making fun of it, but commenting on his beautiful uh, blue wall in the back there. <laughs> We had to, you know, it's like with quarantine, once you start staring at your house for too long, you just have to do something. Got to do so, something or you lose your mind. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it, man. All right, well, let's, let's hear um, the infinite wisdom pour forth from your, from your mouth uh, right now about Scripture. Uh, so just real quick, Chris, in a minute or two, 
uh, just tell us a little bit about about yourself. Okay. Um, you know, I'm just a regular guy. Love Jesus. I have an amazing wife, Cassia. Uh, we have a spunky two-year-old little girl, Lila. Yes. And uh, our second baby girl is on the way in end of September. So, yeah. yeah Praise really the Lord. I'm excited about that. And we've been coming to CAB for... I don't know, I want to say like seven years or something, something along those lines. Um, so I was living in the city. I came up to New Jersey for Cassia. So I was living in Florida, came to New Jersey for Cassia. Godly man, um, godly man. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so I uh, started going to church in the city uh, to Redeemer. And then that's when... You know, I was kind of coming out every weekend to see Cass, and she kind of was like, hey, let's check out this church that I've been going to. And then that's how I came across Cab back in the, uh, in the amazing days of being off of uh, the highway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, Taylor was still, you're talking about the hotel days. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. I mean, technically, we were still on the highway, but yeah, back then. Yeah, oh, man. Praise God. Uh, so you guys live in Hawthorne, right? Yeah. Living Hawthorne, yeah. literally just, Hawthorne. just down the street uh, from us. Living Hawthorne for like three years. Yep. Uh, and and uh, you work as uh, in finance? I do. So I'm a financial planner, financial advisor, whatever title you want to use. But yeah, I basically just help people and individual people, families, business owners, just be really smart or try to be really smart with their finances, their taxes, all the things that nobody really wants to think about <laughs> is what we talk about. Uh, well, so I, 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 I honestly wanted you guys to hear what he does, but I also wanted as a little plug. If you have any questions, if you are looking for a financial planner, I highly recommend him. I ask him questions all the time. He's been, he is very wise in that area, so be sure to reach out to Chris uh, if you have questions there. Well, we are Thanks. not just here to hear um, about you, which is great. We love hearing a lot about you, but we also love Scripture, love reading the Bible. I know you uh, have personally grown a lot in your desire for the Scriptures and to understand the things of God. Um, so just, in a, again, a minute or two, just tell us, for you personally, why is Bible reading so important to you? So why is Bible reading so important to Chris Fandora? Um, I mean, it didn't start this way, but where it is now, it's really like a, a form of sustenance for me. So, you know, some people think of like having a really good night's sleep or have a cup of coffee or whatever it is to kind of make it through their day. But I literally need to read my Bible to um, really just kind of sustain me through the day and the week and the month and the year. And that's grown over time. So I think the more that I've learned and, and just had more of a relationship with Jesus, the more I've wanted to have that relationship with Jesus. And the, and the way to really do that is through the written, written word. Um, you see that and it just speaks to every facet of your life. And so, again, it didn't start that way. Yeah. Um, it started off as just kind of fumbling through, trying to figure out, what I was reading and rereading the same verses like 30 times over. Um, and it felt like probably in the beginning, I, I guess, you know, at the start, it was kind of like, okay, this is something that we're supposed to do. So I'm going to wake up in the morning. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to check the box. I'm going to move on with the rest of my day. But as time has gone by and you go through, you know, the seasons of life, you, uh, you mature from that, I think. And so I really have realized that, I need it. I, I need it to sustain me, to grow me, to speak to the different areas that uh, that I need counsel on, which is all of them. Yeah. And um, and, and and so that's really what it, it, it's been for me. It's almost like, you know, if I have something that I'm questioning or wondering or trying to figure out what to do next, um, you know, I just turn to the Bible and I just pray, 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 pray that the Lord just speaks to me, that the Holy Spirit just moves through the Word. Um, and he's always been faithful to do that. Yeah, you said um, it sounds a lot, a lot like uh, our first guest of this, of this whole series of reading the Bible together was with Raquel Ochoa, and she basically said the same thing. She didn't say sustenance. That's a really, 
really smart word. Uh, so bravo to you for that. She said just food. <laughs> She just said it's like her food, uh, but yeah, so, I mean, obviously it's not, you had said, you need sleep, you need food, you need water, uh, but we need some spiritual sustenance to, to make us go, right? There's like this thing inside of us called our, called our souls that need to be cared for well. <clears throat> yeah, and it's, it's amazing, because then you see when a period happens, and you don't read your Bible, and that happens to me, you know, all the time, unfortunately, you go through these kind of day or week or whatever, um, you can feel it. You feel that something is off. You know, the, the bend of your heart is a particular way. And yeah. so it really just kind of always brings me back. And I just feel like every year more and more, I just realize how important it is, how fruitful it is. And then every time, even if I were to read the same book just over and over and over, every time mm-hmm. I would have something new, something different, some yep. different sort of insight or wisdom to, to glean from. Yeah, that's good. So it really is you know, the most, uh, the most amazing thing that I have. That's awesome. So it's, it's very important to you, um, but obviously we, as you had described, you had said initially it was reading the Bible was kind of a struggle. You kind of had a hard time doing it, kind of fumbling through it. Um, so, but as you do it more, you, be, you improve and you get more fluent in how to read it and how to, yeah. uh, not necessarily like a scholar, but you just kind of know how to work your way through it. So what's, just give us one practical thing uh, that Chris Fandora does that you could offer us that would help us get more benefit and a greater blessing from our, our reading time together um, individually. So it's just one, one practical thing you do. Um, I would say the, the first practical thing was to not treat it as a task. Right. A lot of the times, I like guess, Christians, we feel that, OK, I'm supposed to read my Bible. So as a good Christian, I'm going to read my Bible or read a devotional or, or do something like that so that as a Christian, I can fulfill my duty of I read my Bible today. Um, and, and, and you kind of categorize it. You put it into a box. I would say getting beyond that and not viewing it as a task, but more as something that you desire to do, even when you don't necessarily feel that way. But it's something that you long to do, that you want to do, that you want to hear um, God just speak through the word. So in terms of directly applicable things, um, I I would say I would go through an entire book. And so instead of jumping around too much, I would go through a book and then I would be reading it and I would just take my time. Mm -hmm. It's not like a marathon to try to read through a book of the Bible. There's no sort of, you know, special pat on the back that someone's going to give you. It's okay to take your time and just be in something for weeks. Um, There's times where I've just literally been in one passage for a month, and I just keep reading it and reading it and reading it. So I would say, you know, don't rush through it. Um, And then as you're reading something, you know, and I've learned this from you, really, is looking for that context before and after and looking, you know, you, you've picked up my English grammar a, a lot over the, uh, over the years. That was a major subject in school. So I appreciate that. But um, I would say looking at that, I think commentaries have been helpful in certain ways um, to get context and to get understanding. I think uh, there's a lot of Bibles out there that have been really helpful with kind of footnotes or relating to other passages. So Sometimes I'll read something, and then I see, okay, there's a footnote to somewhere in the Old Testament, and you look at that, and you read that, and you say, wow, this is is how the Bible is fluid. Mm -hmm. This is how there's an overarching theme of Jesus Christ from Old Testament to New Testament. And I think that is probably one of the most amazing, valuable treasures of your Bible, instead of seeing them categorically as separate. Um, more as one fluid story that that really plays on one another, and I think that starts to spark some excitement and and really kind of be like, wow, I didn't can't believe that this verse from something in you know Genesis is connecting to what I'm reading in right. Hebrews, <clears throat> and and you, and you kind of just build on that, and all of a sudden it starts to just take you and go. I would say also something that I've done that's been really good is writing. So. Um, I'll read, and then if I just feel anything, right, or something's coming to my mind, I'll just write. 
and just start writing and writing and writing and just let it flow. And then you'll realize that it kind of starts to become counsel and then a form of prayer and so many different things. So writing has been huge for me. Um, You know, just going a couple verses at a time. I know that's a couple things, but no, we'll we'll take it all, man. No, that was awesome. So we heard, um, don't view it as a task, which, which I know is a big struggle for a lot of people. Um, as hard as that is, it can feel like a task. But you even said yeah. something that you did um, before. Sometimes you, you go into the scriptures, you will pray. Uh, I do that a lot to protect myself from viewing it as a task. Because there are times when I go into right. the scriptures and I don't really feel like engaging with it. And I have to ask the Lord to, to change my heart there. Um, you said to slow down. There's, there's, there's no rush. That is, that'll change your, your reading for sure a ton. Uh, and yeah. then, yeah, taking your time. And then writing. You said was writing that was that was really big, and I like what you said about um, anytime you feel something, you don't always have to write. It's more when the scripture right. like really churns up your heart. F- follow that leading and spill it out on paper, and you'll be. And I love what you said about it becomes a form of counsel, and even it works itself out in in a form of prayer at times too. So that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And. It is. Everybody has those moments where you're reading something and, I mean, whatever it is, Galatians or Romans or yeah. Ephesians, and, and you, you feel something welling up, you know, and you feel that's the spirit moving. And so getting that out and then using that as a reminder. Yeah. You, know, you look back on it in those days where you don't want to read and you just kind of feel tired or like it's not connecting. Looking back on that is really, really um, sweet and valuable. Yeah, yeah. Awesome, man. Dude, it was so good to have you on here. <laughs> Thanks for having me. This yeah, is fun. Yeah, it's good. Uh, it was nice. We just actually went on vacation to the Adirondacks, and so I was hanging out with him um, for a little while. It was good times. But um, Chris, thanks for joining us, man. Love you. Yeah, pleasure. Love you too, man. All Thank right. you. See you. All right. Bye. Bye. Awesome. Praise the Lord. All right, well, let's uh, get into the really, really good stuff, as I always say. Um, you know, hearing from people in the church, it, that's the good stuff, but the, the really, really good stuff is actually diving into Scripture. Uh, so hopefully you guys are blessed by, by Chris, and uh, he, he's one of the, uh, the humblest, uh, meekest, and just, just grace-filled uh, men you'll ever meet. Uh, he's very easy to talk to, uh, so I'm sure that if you reach out to him for anything, uh, he'd be a great blessing, not just for financial help, but even for spiritual help as well. So thanks, Chris, for, for joining us there. Well, here we are. We are going to be diving into Mark chapter 14 next week, I believe, oh, Lord willing. Uh, so keep praying that Pastor Mike takes on the end of chapter 14 there. Um, but let's, let's get, get to work here. Uh, we, if you guys remember, in fact, let me just kind of go back here. This is uh, when we first started in the Gospel of Mark, we started up in the area of Galilee, and Jesus' ministry was all up here. But then towards the end of the book, you'll see that he, it mentions cities and towns that are more southern. So he's working his way, because ultimately Jesus is working his way uh, to Jerusalem. Why? To be crucified for our sins. And we talked about how you'll see the word immediately a lot in the Gospel of Mark because it's kind of this, this urgent rush. Jesus is in a hurry, you might say, <clears throat> uh, to get to the cross and die for our sins. Uh, but uh, this is where we're ending up now uh, in the story. So everything's taking place in, in Jerusalem, and you'll actually see that in the story here. And uh, so let's, let's take a look at our passage, Mark chapter 14. Again, remember, uh, the first thing you want to do anytime you read your Bible is pray. Just ask the Holy Spirit to help you and to encourage your heart, lift up your heart, engage your heart, uh, and then you're going to read slowly. So let's just pray briefly. Holy Spirit, help us to read the scriptures and uh, make our hearts in tune, even mine now and my mind clear. Uh, But most of all, make my heart engaged and thrilled with what's being said here and read here. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's read, and remember, I love what Chris said. You don't have to rush through it. Just take your time, like a normal conversation as you're reading the scriptures. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he, that's Jesus, sent two of his disciples and said to them, 
Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. There, prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. And when it was evening, he came with the twelve, and as they were reclining at table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and to say to him, One after another, is it I? He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Wow. First impressions, right? So if you're watching this on Facebook or YouTube and you'd like to make a comment, we'd encourage you to make comments, more interaction. I know we're not together physically, we're together virtually, so let's make some comments here, try to be somewhat engaged with one another. Just what are your first impressions? If, you, if you're able to write something down, put it down in the comment section below. But what are some of the things that stand out to you, that, that impress themselves upon you? The words that seem to kind of flash before you. What were the phrases, verses as you're reading through that. So the first time you read through the path, you pray, read through it carefully, let things stand out to you, take a mental note of them, or if you have, if you have like a notebook or a journal, you could write them down, uh, just little tiny notes to, to put them out on paper. Uh, and then after you get, get your first impressions, you go back through it. Okay, <laughs> again, this is, you're, you're going nice and slow through this because you'd be surprised by the things that you can pick up when you're taking your time. I'm take a little, little drink here of John Piper. Don't have coffee in here, just water this time. Um, but now that we have our first impressions in our mind, let's walk through this passage carefully. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? So we're, we're talking about Passover here. And if you notice in this first phrase, it says, and on the first day of unleavened bread... When they sacrifice the Passover. Okay, so apparently what's most important is not the fact that it's the unleavened bread, but that it's the Passover, right? So there, even this phrase right here, it seems like the Gospel writer Mark is highlighting this aspect of the, of the uh, unleavened bread season, which is, if you, you can read this about this in the Old Testament, uh, it talks about different days and celebrations and feasts that people, that the Jews would have. Um, but if you, if you look at he seems to be highlighting this idea of the Passover. So what I did was, I just, again, if you maybe want to go a little bit deeper into that, you hopefully have a Bible that has footnotes. Again, if you have the ESV Study Bible app, which I highly recommend that you download it on your phone so you can use that, uh, here is a screenshot of the ESV Bible app of the passages that we're looking at. And when I zoom in on the phrase right here where it says, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb. If you look there, there's a little cross-reference. It's the letter R, okay? So if you just click on that, that letter, here's the R here. You go down there, there's the R there. And it says 1 Corinthians 5, 7. So that tells you another verse that talks about the sacrifice of the Passover. There's something significant about the sacrifice of the pa Passover. So let's go to the cross-reference, right? And remember, remember, a cross-reference is another verse in the Bible that relates to a particular verse that you're reading. It either uses similar words or phrases or talks about similar concepts. Whatever it is, you'd have to find that out for yourself. And as always, you want to read the, the, the cross-reference in its context, right? So don't just read the verse isolated but in its context. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7. This is Paul talking to the church in Corinth. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump, right? Unleavened bread, the feast of unleavened bread. Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a, that you, you may be a new lump. So it seems like Paul 
is now taking this feast of unleavened bread and the Passover, and he's talking about it in a deeper spiritual light. He's not talking about it literally. He's talking about the deeper spiritual meaning and how it applies to us today. That you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, here's the verse, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. So you have in Mark chapter 14, you have the, the disciples talking to Jesus and he's saying, where shall we have celebrate the Passover to be sacrificed? And you have this feast together. And what they don't realize is, is soon they will no longer have to even have this Passover feast. They will no longer have to feast upon a literal Passover because the final Passover lamb has been sacrificed, which is Jesus Christ. Now, I, I am, I'm assuming that, that most of you, if not all of you who are watching this now, are very familiar with, with the Passover, right? The Exodus. You can look at this in your ESV study Bible notes about the significance of the Passover, right? And they're in Egypt, and, and Mo, God tells Moses to have all the, 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 the Hebrews slaughter a lamb, take the blood, put it on the doorpost, and the angel of death will pass over them because another lamb sacrifice has been spilled out in their place. And what we have here is Paul the Apostle saying that, that Jesus essentially is our Passover lamb. So the reason why we don't celebrate the Passover feast anymore because the final Passover has been sacrificed, namely Jesus Christ. And eternal death has passed over us. Now that's not the main point. That's not the main point of the, the passage. Uh, I just wanted you guys to see that if you look in your cross-references, you can find some really interesting things, specifically in how they relate to Jesus Christ and the Gospels. Verse 13, And Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, The teacher says. The teacher says, that is, the teacher is referring to Jesus. The teacher says, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? So this is just Jesus, right? He's just giving them directions about how to, how to do this. And uh, it's very possible that they're doing, Jesus had this whole thing planned out to be done in secret so that he could be prepared. He could just walk right into the city and go straight into the room and not have to wait for anything because tensions are high with Jesus right now. Right? The, the religious authorities are seeking to kill him. They do not want him to have any more influence or authority in Jerusalem. But it seems as if Jesus had planned this out. A man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Um, a lot of times people will speculate and just kind of say, oh, this, this, is, this is evidence of Jesus' divinity, right? He, he knew what would happen. It could be that, but it kind of looks to me like Jesus planned things out. <laughs> That's what it looks like to me. It looks like he had gone to the city before, talked to this man, and had, a, had things arranged, and he talked about this guy carrying a water jar, like so when his disciples come in, then he can, he, they, he has, they have this cue to follow this man into this house. Uh, it looks like Jesus just made, made plans, which is, that's a pretty cool application, right? Jesus is God, and he still made plans, so, so it's probably not a good idea to, to, to wing it all the time, right? It's probably good to have some plans. Uh, so that's, that's kind of all I have to say there. Not a whole lot of amazing spiritual insight there. Maybe you could see something else and encourage me with it. But right now, you just had the, the, the Passover feast. They're about to have it together. Jesus made plans, and now they're going to go. And he, the man with the water jar, will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. There, prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. And when it was evening, he came with the twelve. So everything's set now, and it's, it seems to be it was evening, uh, for time for them to have the feast together, and this is kind of the stage that's been set. Now, there's a lot of deeper, uh, pretty, pretty complex things about to happen in this story here, so I'm going to move on uh, pretty quickly to verse 18. And as they're reclining at table and eating, Jesus said, so they're reclining at table 
and they're eating. They were eating. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and to say to him, one after another, it is I. We're going to talk about this part right here, this little thing, how they all went out around individually and asked, is it I? We'll get to that in just a minute. But I want you guys to notice something. Eating is emphasized here. You have two references to eating. As they were reclining at table and eating, Jesus said, truly I say to you, or their, 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 their mouths are stuffed full with meat and food and things like this. Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. There's a, there's a heavy emphasis on the eating. Something about while they're eating, what's happening here. So what I did is, again, you can look at a cross-reference here. Again, this is a screenshot of the passage, right? And when it was evening, he came with the twelve, and as they were reclining at table, Jesus said to them, one, one of you will betray with me, one who is eating with me. If you notice right there, a little cross-reference, the letter Y, okay? So clearly there's something significant about eating together. So when I click on that, here's... Why? There's the why. And what verse do we have? We have Psalm 41, verse 9, and we have John 13, 18. I want to look at the one in the, the Old Testament, Psalm 41, verse 9. And you're going to see that the reason why the Gospel writer Mark is emphasizing the fact that they were eating, that Jesus talks about the betrayal while they're eating, is because it, this was actually referenced and talked about in the Old Testament. Look at Psalm 41. Verses 7 through 9. Remember, always read a cross-reference in its scriptural context. So rather than starting at verse 9, start at verse 7. This is the psalmist speaking here. All who hate me whisper together. All who hate me. So enemies, right? We're talking about enemies. Whisper together about me. They imagine the worst for me. Right? So he's got all these enemies around him, and they're scheming, and they're whispering and slandering him. They, who's they? They is referring to the enemies. Say, a deadly thing is poured out on him. He will not rise again from where he lies. Verse 9. Even, even my close friends, in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. Even my close friend, in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. This is clearly uh, a, a, a prophetic passage in the book of Psalms that is foreshadowing the suffering of the Messiah, who is Christ. So a lot of times what you see in the book of Psalms is you see people who are suffering, and they say things while they're in their suffering. So for example, Psalm 22, I believe, actually uses the phrase, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When have you heard that? That's when Jesus Christ is being crucified. And then in Psalm 41, you have another sufferer crying out about how his close friend betrayed him and is trying to take him down. What you have here is you have these sufferers in the Old Testament, but no one who is suffering as a sinner is a purely, completely innocent sufferer. So what you have in Jesus Christ is you have the perfect innocent, truly innocent sufferer embodied in Jesus Christ. So that's what you have here. That's the significance of the emphasis upon the eating here. So you actually have a prophecy in Scripture being fulfilled. But what I want to look at here in verse 19, I found this to be interesting. Again, read Scripture slowly and you'll pick up on things that you maybe you hadn't seen before. Verse 19. So Jesus says, to all of them, one of you. He doesn't point at Judas. He doesn't say, hey, Judas, you're going to betray me. He says, one of you. He knows who it is. But he just puts this blanket statement on all of them. He says, one of you guys, one of you is going to betray me. He keeps it ambiguous. 
they began to be sorrowful and say to him, one, look at this, one after another. That, that means Matthew spoke up, and then John spoke up, and then Peter spoke up. And they all went all the way down, each of the disciples, every single one. That means you have 12 people who all asked this question to Jesus. Is it I? You, Jesus heard this was said 12 times. Is it I? Next guy. Is it I? Next guy. Is it I? And the whole time, think about how long that took. It, it's not like they were like, they weren't prepared to do it. So it wasn't like, is it I? 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 <laughs> right? It was probably... Is it I? And it was some silence. Next guy. Is it me? Silence. I mean, this, this is a long time. This is at least, I don't know, let's, let's, just, let's just say here that each person took five to ten seconds to say, is it I, and include awkward silence. Okay, let's say ten seconds. That's 120 seconds of all of them being crushed under the prospect that they might be the one who betrays Jesus. I find this very fascinating. Jesus knows that it's Judas, and yet he's throwing this thing out ambiguously, and they're all letting it land upon them to press on their consciences. Rather than Jesus spare them, you know what? I'm going to just stop here. Um, I'm calling an audible here. If you're watching this and you're able to make a comment, why do you think Jesus would let all of them take their time and ask the question, is it me? Is it me? Every single one of them. Why do you think Jesus would do this? When he could have just taken, he could have saved everyone time and just said, Judas, it's you. He let each one of them feel the prospect. Why do you think Jesus would do that? Put a, maybe put a comment down below here, Facebook or YouTube, if you're watching this. See what you think. Why do you think Jesus would do this? But again, th these are questions you're asking. Why, why would Jesus do this? And, and here's, here's what, what seems, what seems, because you're going to see in just a minute, Jesus never really, according to the, in, the gospel, right, in the gospel of Mark, Jesus never says outright who it is. In fact, he doesn't even answer the question. In the next verse, he doesn't say, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to make you guys all be, be crushed under the prospect that it might be one of you. I'm sorry for that. I didn't mean to, to torture your consciences. Let me, just, let me just spare you guys the suffering here. It's Judas. He never even answers the question. Here's, here's what I think is, is happening. I think Jesus is rightly letting each of them examine themselves and dig around in their hearts and just let something bubble up. Rather than Jesus just smush Judas in a corner and force it out of him, rather Jesus speaks ambiguously and lets the conviction settle upon them to see if the Holy Spirit brings anything to light. It seems that there are, there are times when it's appropriate when, when you're dealing with people who are in sin and have things that are, are concealed, as Jesus did here, that there, there's a way to do it that is not aggressive, that is not interrogating, that is not vicious, that is not pinning them in a corner. It's simply laying something before them ambiguously and letting the Holy Spirit do the convicting work. There is a way to engage someone who is hiding or concealing sin, and you know there's something there. There's a way to engage it that's gently and provides room for the Holy Spirit to work and let it come out on its own. I think Jesus is doing something very, very, he's teaching us here how to engage people who need to bring sin to light. But that's a great question. Is it I? Is it I? I, th I thought about just bringing this question and popping it up really big. You could almost take that question, is it I? Would it be me? That's a very powerful question to ask yourself and to let, is there anything in your life, right? Now we're getting into application. Is there anything in your life that you need to ask Jesus? Is there something in me? 
Is there something in me? This is where self-examination is very good, right? Jesus is asking the questions. He's saying, he's engaging his disciples in such a way that encourages them and and, and pushes them towards self-examination in hopes that the Holy Spirit would bring things to light and convict them to the point of confession. So let's see if Jesus, again, right, he doesn't put them out of misery, right? They all asked, all 12 of them, is it I? And in verse 20, he said to them, it is one of the 12. He still, he still doesn't answer the question. Jesus, you're just like, these, these guys are just getting pummeled in their consciences. That's not always bad. It's not always bad to let, to let, to let a guilty sinner walking in known hidden sin, to let them sit in it and let the Holy Spirit weigh upon them. It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. Again, another reference to Psalm 41, right? He's alluding what's happening here. Verse 21, the end of our passage where we'll conclude. For the Son of Man goes as it is written. For the Son of Man goes as it is written. Notice he says, it is one of the twelve... One who is dipping bread with me. If you go back to Psalm 41, right? It is a close friend. Jesus says it is one of the 12, one of Jesus' inner circle. Back to Psalm 41. Who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. Betrayal. So you have Jesus. This is a clear reference to Psalm 41. Friend and bread. It is one of the twelve who is dipping bread into the dish with me. Now he's giving a reason why. Why is someone going to betray Jesus who's eating bread, specifically his close friend eating a meal with him? Why? Because the Son of Man, another reference to Jesus, goes as it is written of him. So the reason why someone is betraying Jesus right now is, in the Passover feast, in the upper room, is because it was written about in Scripture, and God's word must be fulfilled. Psalm 41, verse 9, must happen. So Jesus is saying, this is why I'm explaining to you why does someone have to betray me, a close friend, eating bread with me? Because I am going about my life according to what God has said in his word must happen to me. That's why it's happening. So the reason why Judas is one of his close friends and literally has taken bread and dipped it into the hummus, maybe, I don't know, they probably probably ate hummus. I think hummus is there, right? And dipped it into the hummus and is eating. Why is Judas doing that? Because the Bible said so. The scriptures prophesied about this. The Messiah must suffer in this way. It must happen. That's why it's happening. But you might be tempted to say, well, that's not fair. If it it has to happen, right? If it has to happen. I just read in my devotionals, right? I'm totally going off script right now. Not that I have a script. I don't have notes right now. I'm just kind of this is, how I, this is how I preach and teach. No notes. That's just how I work. Uh, there, there's, I actually read in my devotionals this morning in Ezra chapter 1. If you look in the first few verses, it says in there, it talks about how Cyrus, king of Persia, he, in order for the Lord to fulfill the word by the prophet Jeremiah, it says that the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus to make a proclamation and put it in writing to set the Jews free to go rebuild the second temple. Ezra chapter 1 says, in order to fulfill what Jeremiah said, God stirred up Cyrus' spirit to bring about the Jews being released from captivity in the Old Testament to go rebuild the temple. When God says something must take place, you want to know how he knows it will happen? He's not merely a predictor of events. He's the determiner of events. The reason he knows something will happen in the future is because he plans to do it in the future. So God does not just say, oh, I see things are going to happen a certain way. Now I know them. He's going, 
I'm going to do this. That's why I know this is going to happen. So you might be tempted to say, well, then Judas shouldn't be held at fault. If it, was pre- if it was planned and it was part of the prophecy in the Old Testament, that's not Judas's fault for betraying the Son of God. It was, it was part of God's plan. So how can you hold Judas responsible? Jesus does not let that thought come into place. Check it out. But. So he's about to say, no, 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 no. Don't think that Judas is off the hook here. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Woe. Like, that woe is not, whoa, that's awesome. That's like, that's like woe to you. Judgment upon you. Responsibility is held upon you. Culpability is held on you. Real, actual guilt is still remaining upon you. Even though the betrayal through Judas based upon Psalm 41 in God's word, had to happen, Judas is still responsible for his actions. That's profound. It would have been better for that man had he not been born. Wow. You want to know why? It seems to be alluding that Judas is eventually, again, It seems to be alluding to. I'm not speaking with absolute fact here. It seems to be alluding to the reality that even though he was destined for this aim and this purpose to betray the Son of God and never repent, eventually he would rightfully and justly be condemned by God in the end. That's a tough word, so I had to look at a cross-reference, <laughs> right? So I zoomed in here. Woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Cross-reference C. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. All right, let's click on the letter C. There's the C. There's the C. John 17, 12. All right, let's go to John 17, 12. Remember, while I was with him, this is Jesus praying in the, he's praying the high priestly prayer in John. He's praying to his father. Here's what he says. Jesus says to his father, while I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, all of his disciples, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, that's Judas, The son of destruction. Why? That the scripture might be fulfilled. You might say, that's not fair, because then Judas is just one of God's pawns to fulfill his word. How can Judas be held responsible? We've already seen in scripture, Jesus holds him responsible. Woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. So what I'm going to do here is, uh, again, we only want to do in this time together what you guys can do on your own. So what I have done, I have looked at the ESV Study Bible Notes. Again, you can find this on the ESV Bible app. Here's what it says about this passage. Jesus confirms that the Son of Man goes as it is written, but woe to that man. It was determined Judas had to do this because it was planned. But Judas is not off the hook. Despite the fact that scriptures have been predicted that Jesus would suffer a substitutionary death, Judas is responsible for his evil deed. This is one of many scriptures that simultaneously affirm God's sovereign ordering of events. God said he would do it in Psalm 41, and he did it in Judas. God determined this. He planned this. He purposed this. And, so, okay, simultaneously is the biggest word here. Simultaneously affirm God is completely sovereign over events and human responsibility for those events. God controls the events, governs the events, providential sees to that events take place, and yet 
even though he's sovereign in total control over our individual choices, we are completely responsible for our actions. How does that work, you might ask? Friends, I don't know. And you will not find a theologian who can answer it perfectly for you. You will find others who may try to find a way out of something like this and say, well, God knew that Judas would probably betray him, but he didn't know that he actually would. So you're telling me that it was possible for God's word not to be fulfilled? That doesn't make any sense. God's word must be fulfilled. In fact, Jesus based everything that was happening in the upper room upon what he had said. God's word must be fulfilled. The highest aim, one of God's highest aims, is upholding the integrity and the glory and the purity of his word. I actually wrote that in my, in my margins this morning, in my wide margin, large print, ESV Bible. You should go buy it. It's amazing. One of God's highest priorities is upholding the integrity of his word. And if he says he's going to do something and someone is predestined to be a part of that plan, well, then God, they're not responsible for their actions. They absolutely are. Jesus just, Jesus perfectly balanced the difficulty of this issue. The Son of Man goes as it is written, as it is written. But woe to that man. It had to happen, but woe to that man. God planned this, but they are still responsible. How does that work? I don't know. Jesus believes that it's possible. If Jesus believes that God can be completely and utterly sovereign over things that are happening, and yet he still holds them responsible like Judas, if Jesus believes that, I'm going to believe that too. If Jesus doesn't explain to me how that can be, I don't say, well, it's a logically inconsistent thing, so therefore there has to be another way of of making sense of it. No, what's wrong with just holding the tension? Why do we have to make sense of all of the tensions in Scripture? Jesus clearly holds both of them in perfect tension. And maybe someday in eternity he will let us see what that is. One last final verse to wrap things up because we're already over time. Excuse me, sorry. Proverbs 16, verse 4. This is not a cross-reference, I'm sorry. So you, unfortunately, you would have to know about this verse uh, in order to make the connection there because it's not actually a cross-reference in here. It says, The Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked, for the day of trouble. The Lord has made everything for its purpose. I even split up this thing in its, in its chunks. The Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked. So the wicked is included in this everything. What's the specific purpose for the day of trouble, the day of destruction? This is profound. And you know what I find amazing about Jesus? This is where we're going to end, right? I was going to look at Romans 9, but we don't have time. What specific aspect of Jesus are you grateful for in this passage? Maybe you should write that down right now. What are you grateful for in this passage? Here, I'll tell you what I'm grateful for, and I really mean this. Jesus knows what's going to happen to him, and it's awful. He knows he's going to be betrayed, and yet he willingly submits himself to his Father's plan in humility and patience and meekness under his Father's hand, trusting him the whole time. He doesn't like how things are playing out, and yet Jesus walks tenderly through God's plan. What do you love about Jesus in this passage, right? That's how you end, end with a beautiful nugget of Scripture. I have gone way over time. I'm sorry. I got really into it. Um, Hopefully you guys are blessed and look forward to uh, reading the Bible together next week for our last and final season. Make sure you send Pastor Mike Reed uh, a text or an email. Let him uh, encourage him to, 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 to end it and close it out for us. That's all the time I have for you. Love you guys.